Hi everybody, uh, Marty here from Chicago EMT Training. Um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about um, oxygen therapy, um, as well as kind of some general ideas pertaining to uh, respiratory problems. Um, so we got some you know, tools on the table here that we're gonna talk a little bit about, and I do wanna talk about a kind of a few different definitions of certain clinical presentations, how to recognize these things, and really how to treat these things. So a lot of the time we hear terms, you know, whether this is in class or whether you see this on a test, you might hear the term dyspnea or respiratory distress or a respiratory failure or respiratory arrest. Um, all of those things mean very different things. Um, they have different presentations. Um, they have different treatments. So first of all, dyspnea, um, you know, I guess in essence means dysfunctional breathing. But when we say dyspnea, that is referring to shortness of breath. It's a subjective complaint. So that's a patient who's saying, I'm having trouble breathing, I can't catch my breath, uh, I feel winded, I feel out of breath. So it tends to be more subjective or in a essence a little more general. So someone having a respiratory problem. So the focus of today, I want to talk about respiratory distress versus respiratory failure. So respiratory distress is going to be somebody who is having some sort of respiratory problem but they're ventilating adequately. That means they're moving air adequately. And then we have someone who, in, who is in respiratory failure. That is also someone having a respiratory problem, but they are not ventilating adequately. So they need assistance uh, from us to ventilate for them. And then we also have kind of a third level, um, and that is respiratory arrest. And that's going to be someone who's also not ventilating adequately. Uh, this is going to be a person who's not really ventilating at all or doesn't have any meaningful ventilations. So let's start off with respiratory distress. Um, respiratory distress, again, is going to be a clinical presentation where someone's having a respiratory problem, but the key thing is they're ventilating adequately. So if someone is ventilating adequately, you know what we're not going to need to use? The BVM. That, that is not going to be on the table. That is not something we're going to have to use for that patient. More likely, um, if someone is in respiratory distress, we're going to be using a nasal cannula device, um, a non rebreather in some circumstances, and even in some circumstances, we're going to be using the CPAP device. So the way I kind of like to explain respiratory distress. So remember back in high school, you had to run the mile, right? Um, someone who is not in respiratory distress, that's someone like walking around the track. You know, the, you know, the kids that wore their, uh, you know, pajamas to school, they're just walking around the track. They're going nice and slow. They're not using too many muscle groups. They're making it around the track with really not much effort. They're not using a lot of muscles to get around that track. Not using a lot of energy to get around that track. Respiratory distress is going to be someone running around the track. They're using more energy to get around that track, and they're using more muscle groups to get around that track. Because that person's using more energy, they're using more work to get around that track, sometimes we want to give them a little bit of help. Um, and we can do so through giving some supplemental oxygen. So because someone is ventilating adequately in respiratory distress, like I said, we're probably going to jump to our, if we're going to treat them um, with oxygen, we're going to select the uh, nasal cannula, the non rebreather, and again, in some circumstances, the CPAP. So when do we use a nasal cannula? Um, you know, there's a lot of debate on when we should be using a nasal cannula. I see some EMS educators say we should never use the nasal cannula. I hear people say we should only use the nasal cannula if they can't tolerate the non-rebreather mask. So is there a clinical benefit or situation where we want to use that nasal cannula? Yes, there is. Um, and there's a lot of nuance. There's different opinions on these things. But generally speaking, we want to look at SpO2 in kind of being the deciding factor in what sort of oxygen therapy we're going to use. So if you have a patient who has an SpO2 below 94%, we're su supposed to treat them with oxygen. There's other factors we're going to look into, which we'll get into a bit. Um, but if someone has a SpO2 between 
93 and 90, I teach people, I tell people to use the nasal cannula. That is classified as mild hypoxia, so we're gonna use low flow oxygen. What's the flow rate for a nasal cannula? Well, you see some variability in what people say there as well. Generally speaking, we say one to six liters per minute. Um, it's really dependent on the type of regulator you have, what your flow rate can be, um, but that is the general accepted flow rates uh, of a um, nasal cannula. So the non-rebreather mask, when do we use the non-rebreather mask? So if we're looking at SpO2, um, if someone's SpO2 is 89 or below, we call that more moderate to severe hypoxia. That is when we should be using the non-rebreather. So with the non-rebreather, I hear people say different things, there is only one dose for the non-rebreather, and that is 15 liters per minute. It's not 10 to 15 anymore. It is 15 liters per minute. That's what we give them. And you're <coughs> achieving roughly 90% oxygen at 15 liters per minute. And that should do a pretty good job in treating any like low SpO2. Um, so when do we use the CPAP then? So sometimes books will say it's a, when someone's uh, in very severe distress um, or early failure. That's very subjective. So what I teach students, what I say to them, is when you start someone on a non-rebreather and you're not getting the result you want, you're not getting that SpO2 to get up to that 94%, um, you know, the SpO2 isn't increasing, then we should be jumping to the CPAP. So if this is not working, jump to this. There are certain clinical presentations that you can jump to this right away. Uh, so if you hear crackles, rowls uh, in the lungs, you can go ahead and select uh, the CPAP. CPAP is a great treatment um, <coughs> for a patient um, who does have pulmonary edema. Um, flail chest, this is a, a good treatment for flail chest as well. But when it comes to the CPAP, there are some contraindications that you're not going to see with the nasal cannula and non rebreather. One, blood pressure. Someone has an adequate blood pressure. They cannot be hypotensive. Two, uh, they have to be conscious. So they have to be kind of awake. Um, three, they need to be adequately ventilating. Remember, if someone's not adequately ventilating, we need to grab this thing. Um, so they need to be adequately ventilating. Um, and somebody needs to tolerate this. This feels uncomfortable. It, it Sometimes it will require a great deal of coaching for us to kind of convince a patient to leave this on their face. Um, it's not going to be the most comfortable of treatments, but it is going to help uh, their problem. Another question I get is when, where does the... Um, nebulizer fit into all of this? Well, a nebulizer is going to treat wheezing, right? So someone could be in respiratory distress with wheezing. So pretty much what I say is if someone is mildly um, hypoxic, um, you give them a nebulizer, let them use that nebulizer, see if that improves their SpO2. Um, if someone's severely hypoxic, um, but again, they're, you know, they're ventilating adequately, they're conscious, um, they could tolerate the mass, they have an adequate blood pressure. We can actually do an inline neb with this CPAP. Um, so someone profoundly hypoxic and wheezing, probably use the CPAP's gonna be the best device. So then we come to respiratory failure. So respiratory failure is like when I'm running around the track trying to do the mile. I can barely get across that track. I'm, all, I'm using every single muscle in my body, every single last kind of molecule of ATP to keep going. My muscles are becoming exhausted. So we talk about accessory muscles. Accessory muscles are those extra muscles getting you around the track. They're those extra muscles that are allowing you to breathe, to ventilate. When, when we're in respiratory failure, those muscles are starting to fail. Um, we're burning so much energy that these muscles just cannot do what they need to do any longer. So we need to pick this person up and carry them around the track. And we pick them up by using this BVM. So this is going to be for someone who is not adequately ventilating. When we say inadequate ventilation, we're looking at two major things. Inadequate tidal volume and or inadequate rate. Um, so if someone doesn't have an adequate rate of ventilation or an adequate 
and or an adequate tidal volume, we're gonna wanna use this BVM. Um, with regards to the BVM, um, we never use the BVM by itself. And this is kind of, I call this my trifecta of the bag valve mass. So think of a triangle, so think of a triangle. On the top, we have the BVM. On one of the corners, we're gonna have airway adjuncts. So that's OPA or NPA. And then on the other corner, we're going to have manual maneuvers. So if we're using the BVM, we're also using an airway adjunct and a manual maneuver. If we're using a manual maneuver, we're also using a BVM and an airway adjunct. And if we're using an airway adjunct, we're also using a manual maneuver and a BVM. These three things always in every single situation must be used together. Um, of course, sometimes a patient won't tolerate um, a adjunct, um, but we need to think about it. We need to consider it. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, we have a situation where we might want to do a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust maneuver, but we should always be thinking of those three things. Those three things are used uh, in conjunction with each other. <laughs> so um, someone who is in respiratory failure or respiratory arrest, not ventilating at all, will have a profoundly low SpO2. Um, we're going to hook this up to high flow oxygen, 15 liters per minute or as high as that regulator really will go is what we want to plug this into so that every time we squeeze the bag, we're delivering 100% um, oxygen. Um, we want to uh, give the patient um, a breath every five to six seconds, um, which is going to total 12 or 10 to 12 breaths per minute. Um, and we're giving them enough volume just to see chest rise and fall. That's adult patients. Uh, pediatric patients, you want to go up to 20 breaths a minute or uh, a breath every three seconds. So some other kind of clinical presentations, and these, these are general rules, you're not always going to have that, but typically someone in respiratory distress, they're going to be conscious, they're going to be, you know, alert and oriented, they might be a little anxious, um, they're probably going to have pale skin, and um, that's kind of a sign of earlier hypoxia, they might, they might have some tachycardia as well, and typically some tachypnea. Um, the big thing with respiratory distress is that they're still making it around the track, but they're using more energy to do so. So giving them some oxygen and maybe a nebulizer if they're wheezing can help them with that. And then when we talk about respiratory failure, we're going to see things like unresponsiveness or severe altered mental status. We're going to see extremely fast ventilatory rates or extremely slow ventilatory rates that are shallow. Um, we are going to have cyanosis develop now. Um, and it tends to be more profound. Um, we are probably going to still see tachycardia as well, um, but this is definitely going to be a much sicker person. And then when we get down to respiratory arrest, um, well, feel a pulse, folks. Um, you know, in my time as being a paramedic, and I know people have had different experiences, but I never really had a patient who wasn't ventilating who uh, also uh, didn't have a pulse or did have a pulse. So. If someone's not breathing, they probably don't have a pulse. Um, but when we think of uh, treatment, we need to kind of think a little more objectively because like uh, you know, I said, these things are all different. So the you need to select pretty much when we're looking at someone's respiratory distress, one of the main things we wanna look at is distress versus failure. And if we're in distress, we're gonna be using these tools. If we're in failure, we gotta be using this.